Thanks, Candice. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm glad that you're spending uh, some part of your Wednesday with us. And, um, you know, we're really excited to share, you know, our vision for enterprise Kubernetes done right. And, um, you know, just wanted to throw out a couple of takeaways uh, to get, you know, get this agenda rolling. Uh, what we intend on doing over the course of the next few minutes is just taking you on a journey and uh, just trying to understand, you know, what some of the common challenges with adopting Kubernetes are, some of the common deployment patterns that we've seen, challenges that customers run into as far as adopting complex, you know, deployment patterns that meet their business requirements, and also really, you know, focus on the importance of an open source, you know, Kubernetes in a strategy, right? And how that's going to help you achieve that uh, multi-cloud strategy and help your organization be successful with cloud native adoption. So hopefully the takeaways from uh, this webinar are going to include uh, what it takes to transition platform built on Kubernetes that is what we call enterprise grade and production ready and also how you can be an active participant or uh, someone who is an advocate for the adoption of smart cloud native you know, applications within your organization. All right, with that, uh, let's dive straight in. So uh, one of the key topics that we wanted to kick off with is the fact that Kubernetes has become the de facto standard for building modern cloud native applications that are out of the box, you know, scalable and are resilient to failure, right? So Kubernetes has seen massive adoption over the course of the last few years and um, has become the de facto standard for uh, building modern cloud native applications. Uh, an interesting trend that we're also seeing is the fact that Kubernetes is almost kind of being likened to what you know, Linux was, um, you know, many, many years ago, which is um, just the abstraction layer for your underlying infrastructure. So Kubernetes is being positioned as almost a cloud operating system that allows you to build applications uh, in a very decorative way and allow you to deploy those applications, um, you know, wherever, you know, whether it's on-prem in your data center or in, you know, a public cloud provider. And, should we talk, Shavik, yeah. a little bit about why why Kubernetes is is the one? Why it's it's as you I, I like your reference here. Why it is the way, yeah. as they would say in the Mandalorian. Yeah. What what made what made Kubernetes win? Yeah, let's. Uh, uh, we can definitely talk a little bit about that. Dan, do you want to lead that off, and you know I can chime in. Yeah. Well, I think I think you hit on some of it. I think that it was built mm -hmm. to mimic some of the patterns that that we saw at the hyperscalers. Uh, that allowed them to build very scalable and very resilient applications. You know, they they realized that their lifeblood, their very business depended on that site, that app always being up. And so they had to come up with ways that uh, were were very resilient, that that prevented human error, that prevented hardware error from, from taking down the site. And so this move to containers really started there as, as they realize that if we if we say, hey, forget the server, no one ever deploys anything to a server. We're using containers. Those containers can be scaled effectively. They could be up. And Kubernetes really takes those patterns and makes them accessible to everybody. So I think that's one of the big reasons. You want to hit on another one or two? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So the way um, you know the deployment patterns for applications, you know, what Kubernetes enables you to do is, um, I use the term declarative, you know, a minute ago, right? So what I mean by that is, you really don't need to have any human intervention when you're, you know, deploying your applications. You simply define the resources that your application needs. Um, resiliency is factored in through maybe the use of like replicas where you're able to deploy applications in a highly uh, available fashion. And it's up to Kubernetes as the orchestration platform to ensure that your application stays online, right? So there really isn't any room for, you know, human error or, you know, there really isn't any intervention needed as far as, you know, your application is concerned, right? Uh, um, or maintenance of your application is concerned. And then fast deployment when it comes down to operations and when it comes down to like maintaining your applications, it's much more simpler to lifecycle manage you know, applications leveraging, you know, Kubernetes APIs, you know, through automation, right? Uh, there are capabilities that exist within Kubernetes that allow you to 
um, you know, deploy applications using, um, let's say, a rolling strategy, which really ensure that uh, you're able to gracefully update versions of your applications without having to go through traditionally being in IT for many years. It's like, you know, it's not your traditional maintenance windows you need to be worried about, right? That we've had stories, you know, of, you know, people adopting Kubernetes in production and making changes, um, you know, significantly without having to like really factor in maintenance windows or, you know, one of the value propositions we talk to uh, customers about or operators about is the fact that uh, you really are not going to be spending, you know, the same amount of um, time on maintenance windows as far as, um, you know, application rollouts and deployments are concerned, right? It really challenges right. your developers to think about, you know, application deployment or modern software uh, development lifecycle in a different way, right? And you're really getting all the goodness of, um, you know, just like you mentioned, the hyperscaler culture, it's something that could be adopted within your own enterprise. And I want to hit on one other thing before we get on the next slide. And, and that is that, so we talked about why people adopt the technology. And of course it is portable because you can run Kubernetes anywhere. You, you move to the cloud, you can run it on premises, you can run it on any cloud. But I want to point out one thing which is really encapsulated in both of those, those bottom bullets, which is the innovation in app deployment, the innovation in operations, the innovation in, de in, in developer experience is all around Kubernetes today. If you were to choose another platform, then you would be missing out on that innovation. And even if you look at what the major, I don't know, networking vendors, look what, what uh, say F5, Cisco is doing, what, what Palo Alto Networks is doing, they are all innovating on top of Kubernetes now. And so if you want to be able to take advantage of what's happening in technology, you have to be in this space. So yeah. Kubernetes is the way, I, th I, think, I, think, I think we can agree. No, completely right. And it's just, the ecosystem is just so rich and there's just, you know, vibrant from the perspective of all of the innovation that's going on in there, right? And uh, you hit on networking, um, just think of any other capability that you would use to like, you know, build out a platform, right? Whether it's um, something that's, you know, security related or you're talking about integration with your existing uh, storage fabrics or, integration with uh, your existing, you know, network solutions that allow for, you know, um, you know, layer seven capabilities, right? All of these ISVs who are like working in this ecosystem and unlocking all of these capabilities for customers are definitely ensuring that they do have a solution for Kubernetes and Kubernetes is almost becoming that substrate to like, you know, build, you know, your platform on and, you know, deploy your applications on just purely because it's just a lot of community engagement and a lot of where the innovation is happening, right? So, so if I'm a CIO and I'm attending this webinar and I'd say, okay, great, like Shafiq can convince me we're going to uh, Kubernetes, we're done. Should they sign off now? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, or well, should you get uh, to the next slide? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, that's uh, that's a great that's a great lead-in, right? And thanks for that, Dan. Like, um, uh, I was I was joking when I said yes, right? So uh, Kubernetes by itself, again, Kubernetes by itself is just giving you the container orchestration capability, right? So we're seeing a lot of um, uh, adoption of a mindset of building teams that are you know engineering platforms, right? So what constitutes a platform? Um, you know. Coming, going back to my, you know, solution architect days and consulting days, it's it's always about like, you know, building something that makes sense to the business that's going to accelerate uh, business outcomes for, you know, a specific organization and almost just kind of being very laser focused about adopting innovation to really move the needle when it comes down to solving challenges for your uh, organization, right? So that being said, if I'm looking to build a platform and I'm looking specifically to build a Kubernetes-based platform, Kubernetes just gives me this one capability, which is um, what we just talked about or discussed in the previous slide, which is robust um, in a container orchestration, a resilient way to deploy your applications. In order to build a feature complete platform that allows you to really meet those requirements that you know your business might have you need to like start figuring out what some of the other capabilities um, you're going to also build alongside kubernetes right so it could be something along the lines of um, uh, figuring out how you integrate with storage how you do secrets management what your application deployment um, you know, formats are going to look like, uh, how do I, you know, provide my developers 
you know, a service mesh technology? How do I handle uh, networking, whether it's uh, load balancing or trying to like, you know, figure out how I'm going to secure uh, applications uh, using, you know, certificates or trying to like ensure that all of the applications that I deploy have, um, you know, HTTPS, you know, encryption for their mode of communication, or if my platform is going to be serving or providing resources to multiple teams, do I have robust, you know, multi-tenancy included, right? So it's not just about Kubernetes, it's much more complicated than that because you really need to like figure out how I'm going to unlock all of those additional capabilities. And those were just some examples and they're by no means a complete list, but the idea is you really need to look at what's out there in the ecosystem and which vendors you're going to work with, whether it's you know a commercial vendor or uh, the graphic out here is the CNC of landscape, right? Which projects you're actually going to like you know cherry pick and choose uh, because you have multiple options for each of these capabilities. I call them like uh, technologies that underpin a capability, right? So the concept here is you need to do a lot more work in building out that feature complete platform or quote unquote a batteries included platform when it comes down to Kubernetes. Yeah, I think that I think that's really important to to note because you as you said, Kubernetes is a, a container orchestration platform, yep. right? That's what it does. And the reason the, the the cloud native landscape is so complex is that there are many things you need for security for all of those things you you notice on top of it. So if again, like let me put myself in the shoes of that that CIO. I'm saying, okay, so I, I have to settle on Kubernetes. And yes, I do need to secure everything. I might need to figure out, do I need MTLS? What do I need? Do I need uh, smart you know, L7 load balancing? Um, what am I going to do about secrets? Does that mean that, uh, well, it seems like the decision to adopt Kubernetes was an easy one, but there's a lot more research in front of me because I'm going to have to learn what each of these icons means. What's behind this project? What, you, what purpose is it, is it filling? Uh, how does that fit with my requirements? And then choose each one. Is, is that what you're telling me? I've got another six or nine months of work ahead of me to try and figure out how to turn this container orchestration platform into a real, uh, you know, enterprise ready cloud native smart cloud platform. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Like it's going to cost me an extra nine months. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it looks like, right? That's typically the journey that you go on once you've decided to, you know, go down the path of like, you know, Kubernetes, right? So it's a significant amount of research. And um, yeah, it takes it takes a significant amount of investment from you know a people time perspective to figure out you know what your you know end state technical stack looks like. Okay, but but, but let's say I do that right. So yeah. it, so I put in that nine months. Then 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 am I ready? Then can I just turn my application developers loose where my operations people were set? Yeah, that was that was going to be my next question or my lead in was going to be. Great, we've figured out now, uh, hopefully you're along for the journey, right? You know, the story that we're trying to paint here. So we've figured out the technical stack. Um, we've made our choices. Uh, we've decided that the business needs a platform with all of these capabilities. We've picked all of these different, you know, technologies to underpin those specific capabilities. Does it end there? That's just your, that's just your day one. Uh, what happens after, right, is the question, right? Um, significant operational challenges ahead, right? And what do we mean by that, right? Installation, uh, great. You've got one stack ready to go. Uh, what if you get massive success and you know everybody wants in on the platform and you decide to roll out this technical stack uh, to multiple you know, geographies, for example, right? We, you know, we deal in you know, a largely distributed world nowadays and um, you know, we really want to, provide the same experience or a consistent experience across your organization, across multiple geos. So there is still a challenge associated with, have you figured out the automation or like just gen uh, generally the installation aspect of how you're gonna manage this technical stack? Right, yeah. and I think it's important yeah. to note that, that you've got not just one thing, you know, as you just said, we've got Kubernetes and many of those things run on top of Kubernetes. Some of those things are running underneath Kubernetes, right? You're now, and each of those projects has its own release cycle. So this, this process itself is, is gonna be significant, right? As you say, it's gonna be significant every time you turn something up, every time you turn up a new 
for you know, yeah, new, new data center, new region, even a new cluster. But now you've got all these different components with dependencies between them, possibly reliance on each other, and they each have their own life cycle, right? Upgrade, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. And upgrades, that's that's another key part of it, right? So if day one signifies, you know, just getting your technical stack up and running based on the design that you put together, uh, what does, you know, subsequent days look like or what does post day one look like? Um, let's say, you know, a quarter down the road, you decide um, I really need a specific capability that one of these projects is getting me. What is your upgrade strategy going to look like? And then it's not just for a single cluster because you were so successful and you saw massive or you've seen massive adoption uh, with your platform that you've just built. Uh, you need to like figure out how you're going to roll out or what your upgrade strategy is going to look like, you know, globally for all of the clusters that you have running in production, right? So upgrade is a key aspect. Dan alluded to the whole interoperability bit, right? Uh, so now we have all we all know the benefits of you know leveraging you know open source, uh, but then just like Dan mentioned, each of these projects, you know, there there really isn't any synchronization when it comes down to. Um, you know, the release cycles or, you know, whether someone's, you really need to be meticulous about, you know, going through documentation and figuring out whether, you know, a specific, you know, project or a specific um, uh, technical capability is compatible with maybe the underlying version of Kubernetes that you're running on, you know, breaking changes happen, right? You know, that's, that's something uh, that we've seen often as operators or someone who's been in IT for a while, you know that breaking changes happen. And uh, uh, just reading the fine print and just ensuring that you're managing all of those moving pieces from an interoperability perspective is uh, another key challenge from um, an operational perspective. Um, and last but not least, security, right? We are dealing with complex you know, distributed systems. Kubernetes by itself is a distributed system with multiple moving parts. Um, then we are not even we haven't even started talking about the workloads, right? So it depends on the workloads that you deploy in the platform. What is your strategy to secure, you know, the workloads, the platform itself, and then the workloads that run on the platform? So I think I think one important thing is you said the workloads are your business, and you're going to have to, you know, you you got to figure that out. But the platform, I think that's a really important thing, right? We just show that open source landscape. And, and you know, you're going to need a dozen, two dozen of those of those projects at least, right? You're going to become very acquainted with the letters CVE, Common Vulnerability uh, Exposure, right? Yep. Um, and, and each of those will have to be something that you are paying attention to because when some of these CVEs come out, they will affect you and they will affect the, you, you think you, you might think you're in control of your upgrade and your, your interop, uh, interoperability. And then all of a sudden you've got to patch a component that you didn't know you were going to have to patch, right? Again, re, re, aside your, from your own code, you're reliant on open source project and open source project. So security becomes a very important operational challenge that you have to solve, right? Yep. No, and this is this is what leaders and you know architects and everyone you know working in this ecosystem are constantly thinking about, right? How do I, you know, the term that's being flow that's being floated nowadays is reducing the cognitive load associated with operations, right? Just making it simple. It's about um, figuring out um, how I can minimize the amount of time that I'm spending on operations. All right, so. I've solved that then, right? Or I have a strategy or I work with somebody to figure out um, how I reduce my cycles or my team cycles spent on operations. Uh, what's next? What's next in the journey? So, so I think that the thing that we have to bear in mind is, as, we're, as we're doing this, as we're thinking about adopting Kubernetes, we're adopting uh, this new technology. One thing to understand is that you have to solve this in a way that you've solved it in more than one place. I think there was, and I, I spent a lot of time uh, working at Google Cloud, and uh, when we spent a lot of time and, and the other vendors as well, trying to get people to move to the cloud, thinking eventually it's all gonna run up there, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually people are gonna choose a cloud, they're gonna move everything up there. But what we're seeing increasingly, um, and, and what every, every attendee of this, of this call is seeing is that it's never gonna be 100% in the cloud, and in fact, CIOs are saying, uh, and CTOs are saying, no, 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 hybrid cloud isn't 
a waypoint along the destination. Hybrid cloud is where we're going to end up. So as you're choosing your Kubernetes solution, unless you want to double your work, double your operations staff, increase their, I love that, that term, their, their cognitive load, mm -hmm. you are going to have to solve it in a way that it solves both for what you run in the cloud and on-prem, and chances are it's not just one cloud, right? Yeah, chances are it's not just one cloud. It's, um, you know, a lot of organizations, um, even if they do not start off directly with a multi-cloud strategy, they definitely want a hybrid cloud strategy, which is a combination of their own uh, private data centers with uh, a primary, you know, cloud provider, right? And that's a significant, you know, that tends to be, um, you know, a significant, um, you know, investment that uh, they're, you know, they're definitely exploring. Uh, outside, outside. Uh, so, what are what do you think are some of the common use cases for you know multi cloud management? This is this is a conversation I love having, um, and uh, maybe I'll I'll throw in a couple of those use cases. So, outside of you, you mentioned that everyone's looking at a multi cloud strategy or a hybrid cloud strategy because the data is not going to move, right? So, the data gravity or uh, governance requirements might dictate you know, a multi-cloud strategy or a hybrid cloud strategy. What else, what else are we thinking here? Well, if, if, you're, if your company is big enough, if you're, if you're you know, working at a, at a Fortune 2000 company, uh, one of the reasons is that one of the ways you got to be a Fortune 2000 company was through acquisition. You're acquiring companies and they're already deployed somewhere. And they might be deployed somewhere in such a way that it's very difficult or expensive for them to move. They might be dependent on services. They're, they're absolutely there. Uh, other companies refuse to be dependent on single vendors. Absolutely, in financial services, I would hear about the four cloud strategy. And the four cloud strategy is the three major players plus our own. And they were all very, very clear that they, for sometimes for bargaining reasons, sometimes for uh, resilience reasons, and just not wanting to be dependent on a single company, they wanted to ensure that they could always choose. Um, so th there are a bunch of reasons. Sometimes you're running a workload that someone really does have a proprietary technology yeah. technology running in their cloud, and it makes sense for you to run a workload near that near that technology. Yeah, uh, a couple of other common use cases that I've come across is just as it could be as simple as just business continuity or DR, right? We've definitely seen mm -hmm. a disaster recovery, right? So it's just all about uh, leveraging multiple cloud providers just to ensure that your business is not impacted in the event of an outage, right? So that's that's one common strategy. The other one is with the rise of uh, just being, uh, just having a distributed world that we live in today is just all about, you know, what I call the pop architecture, right? Which is a point of presence, right? It's just about having, uh, you know, your services running as close to your user as possible, right? Or your end users as possible. So the idea of just having that point of presence, you know, in a global world, in a world that's, you know, increasingly getting digitized, you know, that makes a lot of sense, right? So you definitely want to have, you know, multiple cloud providers, you know, certain cloud providers might not have the regions uh, that, you know, in a, in a market that you're potentially looking to tap into. So that's, that's another, um, you know, great, um, you know, use case as well. So, so we, the headline <laughs> are we both are we going to both transition here you, you you go ahead you transition yeah yeah all right so uh we we discussed a little bit about you know multi-cloud and we talked about why multi-cloud is a challenge a little bit we touched on that the reason we are kind of like transitioning to this slide is we want to talk about what some of what it really looks like at the deployment level, right? When you decided that, okay, multi-cloud or hybrid cloud is something that you really want to do, what are some of the challenges associated with actually getting that working, right? So and that's Kubernetes where, is open source, right? Doesn't, yeah. didn't we already choose open when we chose Kubernetes? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, uh, we did, we did, you know, that's, that's the aspect, right? You know, uh, that's the aspect that we want to like, you know, really talk about here. Kubernetes is supposed to be open source. Um, so, you know, are we connecting the dots? Yes, we are, right? So, you know, we really want to be able to use uh, a Kubernetes based solution in order to like, you know, help, um, help with some of those challenges that really, you know, are tied to, let's say a multi-cloud strategy, right? So the first pillar being here, let's talk about portability. Uh, especially when you decide to go hybrid cloud, uh, 
the idea here, I'm, we're trying, uh, trying to tie a couple of concepts here where if the objective is to have a hybrid cloud strategy, and then as a CIO, I want to reduce the time spent on operations. Um, I really don't want to have multiple you know, modes of operation when it comes down to maintaining uh, you know, my platform in a private data center or in one of the cloud providers and you know, have a different experience all over the place, right? The idea about you know, leveraging Kubernetes to do this is the fact that you have the portability of just having a unified experience across any infrastructure that you might be uh, leveraging in order to build out this multi-cloud strategy or hybrid cloud strategy that you're looking for. Does that help then? Did I, am I, 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 think, I think it does. And, and I think there's, there's, there's more too, because I think that Kubernetes is absolutely open source. And, and there are lots of vendors who will, who will package a Kubernetes into, a, into a, uh, essentially a platform for you. But they don't all uh, really allow pluggability at every layer. Right. There are some that say, oh, you, you can use Kubernetes, but you have to use it on our operating system, for example. Yeah. Or we've got we've got a, a monitoring system built in and, and we don't allow you to plug that in. And one of the beauties of Kubernetes and one of the reasons that Kubernetes won is that not just that it was open source, but that it had pluggability everywhere. Right. If you want look at service mesh, I used to work on the Istio project. Right. There's probably four service meshes in in uh, in the uh, cloud native landscape. So. When you're choosing Kubernetes done right, when you're building not just Kubernetes but that platform, and you're and you're choosing a platform to build on, you want to ensure that your platform allows you to plug in what you want to plug in, right? And I think that that's really important because you are cutting yourself off from some of the innovation in this cloud native landscape if you're building a platform that when something innovative happens, you can't plug it in. Your vendor says, "Oh no, 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 we don't we don't allow you to do that." So I think that's that's really important. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's, it's not, it's not, so that's the key difference here, right? It's, it's not a pass, right? A pass is a very opinionated way of doing things. The philosophy, the ethos behind building a platform, leveraging Kubernetes is the whole pluggability aspect, right? You know, we have conversations, um, you know, all the time with folks who have like certain opinions on, you know, how a capability is delivered. Like, uh, let me give you an example. When we're, we're talking about logging, for example, right? So there are a bunch of uh, solutions out there, or there might be an enterprise standard that says this is how you have to do logging, right? You know, and there for very good reasons. You know, it could be for audit purposes, or you know, it could be for just ensuring that um, uh, you're able to, you know, figure out, um, you know, forensic information based on access to your applications or data. So there are very good reasons why enterprise standards exist for a specific you know, capability. And you really want to like be able to you know, have a platform that can readily plug into those standards or plug into uh, those specific requirements or meet those requirements, right? And you know, we're, you know, that's, that's a pretty exciting thing about um, you know, Kubernetes and building out a platform that is based on Kubernetes. You just have the pluggability aspect. And Dan touched on this a little bit, you know, the innovative aspect or the innovation aspect, right? There's always something uh, innovative going on as far as, you know, the Kubernetes ecosystem is concerned. You know, the, everyone likes talking about the service mesh and Dan touched on that a little bit, but uh, it's very exciting, you know, for developers, you know, because a service mesh allows you to, you know, not really impose limitations on your developers, right? So it's a polyglot way uh, world where, you know, developers have their uh, preference for, you know, what they're developing in. And you really want to like decouple some of the non-functional capabilities from your application code, right? So if you're looking at, you know, building a capability that's, you know, a Dan referred to mutual TLS, you know, just ensuring that the applications uh, communicate in a secure way, or you really want to like implement a circuit breaker pattern just to ensure that you're able to like you know meet certain SLOs or you know cut off traffic when you know there is an incident. You know those are capabilities that a service mesh brings to the table, and that's just one example of like some of the innovation that's going on in the ecosystem, right? Okay, so I'm going to devil's advocate again. Uh, all the cloud providers now have managed Kubernetes. Again, if I'm that CIO CTO, can I just take that managed Kubernetes and 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 assume that that's okay, right? They, it's it's all managed for me. Doesn't that solve this problem? Not really, <laughs> and we'll we'll talk about why, right? 
So the question here is, you know, all the cloud providers or is managed Kubernetes a solution, right? Everyone's, um, you know, got a you know, managed Kubernetes solution now. It only solves part of the problem, right? So, you know, going back a few years, typically if you, when you were getting started in this cloud native journey that hopefully we've been uh, doing, uh, you know, a current job of just kind of uh, taking you on, you start off with like figuring out what makes sense to me from a technology perspective. You land on communities, you understand that this is the future, this is how I want to develop my applications. I want to really uh, get away from the business of managing servers. I want to abstract my underlying infrastructure and provide my developers a great experience. All right, fantastic. Uh, but then, you know, there was a period of struggle where, you know, customers typically, or, you know, folks working with communities, they go through a bunch of challenges when it comes down to like, you know, figuring out how to run this in production, right? That enter the cloud managed, you know, Kubernetes services, right? They really abstract away some of the really hard parts of operating Kubernetes in production, right? Like for example, the common, you know, punchline or the tagline, Dan, like a few years ago was, um, oh man, I'm just so worried because I have to operate etcd in production, right? Or, you know, I'm troubleshooting, um, you know, problems with the, you know, raft protocol or just trying to like, you know, figure out, you know, what's going on here. Um, you know, why did I, you know, lose my cluster, right? So that's a challenge the managed community services definitely solve for, right? They make that aspect of operating Kubernetes or that component of Kubernetes, which is a central domain system, almost a black box, right? So the idea is, you focus on figuring out what your business outcomes are, figuring out the other aspects of the design that you need that you need to be spending your time on as far as far as the platform is concerned, right? You know, choosing the appropriate um, you know instances of which machine types that you need in order to like you know support your workloads and figuring out the other things that we just spent the last few minutes talking about, which was you know building out rest of the stack. Dan was right. That, so yeah, yeah. I think I think I think I think that's exactly right. Your managed Kubernetes are fantastic offerings. I think the best advertisement they ever got was Kubernetes the hard way by, by Kelsey Hightower, right? Because it showed mm -hmm. installing, running Kubernetes is tough. You can get Kubernetes out of the box from any of the cloud vendors and never have to worry about any of that aspect again. But those limitations that we talked about, Kubernetes at its heart really is container orchestration you still need to layer in all those pieces. And, and while different cloud vendors have done different things to make that a little bit easier, for the most part, it is not a, a platform out of a box. And you still need to put a lot of pieces in place on top of it to take that managed Kubernetes into a you know, complete integrated automated platform. And now is when you get to talk about uh, why D2IQ and, and something like uh, AWS EKS are better together. Yeah, so uh, we're going to, uh, you know, use our, you know, friends and our partners um, at AWS as an example here. And EKS is, you know, a great distribution as far as uh, great, um, you know, ma cloud managed, you know, Kubernetes, um, you know, service that, you know, you can run in production. But then just like Dan mentioned, at the end of the day, it's still Kubernetes and you still need to spend a significant amount of time trying to like figure out how you're going to build out this feature complete platform, right? So there, there are a couple of, um, you know, patterns that we've seen, you know, how customers or, you know, folks working in this domain uh, try to like solve for this problem, right? One is a pure do-it-yourself approach. So great. Uh, it's a scenario that I described, right? I really want to like make the uh, operations related to Kubernetes uh, simple. So I'm going to go with EKS, uh, but then I decide to curate the rest of my you know, technical stack using open source components, perhaps, you know, borrowed from the CNCF landscape, right? So then we are back to the same problem, right? What are we doing for uh, figuring out a strategy that's going to allow you to consistently install these on multiple clusters? Then it becomes challenges related to, you know, upgrades. Uh, it goes back to uh, interoperability challenges. It goes back to security challenges, right? So it's that circle that we had like earlier in the presentation. So that's the first approach. You're, you know, using EKS plus uh, just completely doing it yourself as far as, you know, the uh, rest of the capabilities are concerned. The second approach that we've seen is obviously the cloud vendors have managed services that unlock, you know, some of these capabilities, right? So for example, you know, staying within the AWS ecosystem, 
Uh, you might have, you know, CloudWatch for your, you know, logging and metrics. Uh, there is, um, you know, a solution available for maybe, you know, continuous deployment on Kubernetes. You could decide to like, you know, stitch all of those together and integrate all of them with EKS to get that feature complete platform that you need, right? But then obviously, uh, you're going to be, uh, you know, if um, your CFO is watching, <laughs> uh, you really need to be on point in terms of just understanding what costs all of these represent and just be able to like, you know, build out the appropriate, um, you know, um, you know, cost model just to ensure that, um, you know, it meets your, you know, business requirements or if you have specific uh, TCO or ROI targets, you know, you really need to be uh, in a cognizant of the fact that each of these services costs their own, um, you know, money, right? And then- And, uh, and you need to be yeah. aware of costs. I mean, you need to be aware of portability, right? Because yeah, if, you're, if yeah. you're dependent on a cloud service um, and you need to run your, you know, you're, you're in that hybrid cloud world or that multi-cloud world, that means now you're using different services, right? And, and one thing we haven't talked about very much is that there are many use cases uh, in, including on-prem in the cloud, but on-prem especially, where, where you need to run an air gap cluster. And you can't use a cloud-based solution for any of these in those cases. So, exactly. so I think, yeah, the, the point here is, is a great one that, that uh, the managed Kubernetes services are fantastic. Um, and when you're in the cloud, they're a really good way to get Kubernetes. Be aware that Everything else that you need to do in terms of security, in terms of networking, in terms of backup, in terms of, by the way, incomplete list here, um, is still something that needs to be done on top of those. And you need to solve those problems uh, and you wanna solve those consistently organization wide so you don't have individual teams solving them in individual ways, especially differently in individual clouds and, and on-prem locations. Exactly, a unified operational experience, right? We touched upon that a little bit, you know, earlier in the presentation, right? We really want to have a consistent experience, especially if you're, you know, trying to tackle a hybrid cloud deployment or a multi-cloud, you know, strategy. Uh, you really want to strive for having a unified experience, irrespective of what your, you know, underlying infrastructure looks like, right? Whether it's on-prem with bare metal, Dan mentioned, you know, air gap, right? Um, if you have workloads that are running in your private data center, um, are you going to, well, something to think about is, are you going to have a different operating model when it comes down to like, um, you know, versus what you have in the cloud? And then the third approach that I was um, going to touch on a little bit is the fact that um, the cloud vendors obviously being very customer first, you know, they are working towards like enabling some of these capabilities, you know, with EKS, right? So we definitely want to acknowledge that. And, you know, that is something that's, um, you know, getting gathering ahead of steam. Uh, again, it more or less aligns with you know what the challenges are as far as you know the second scenario was concerned. Uh, second scenario is concerned, which is uh, you end up using you lose a little bit of portability there just purely because uh, you're using opinionated tooling, uh, which will you know just work in a specific cloud vendor's ecosystem. And, um, you know, it's really not something that you could just kind of pick up and use when you decide to like either move your workloads back on prem or you decide to, um, you know, leverage a different cloud provider for whatever reason, right? So the loss of portability is, um, you know, pretty key there as well. So the graphic on the right, what it's just uh, meant to articulate is um, uh, with DTYQs, um, you know, Kubernetes platform with EKS, it's a complete integrated in you know, a turnkey solution using open source technology that allows you to like, you know, standardize your experience across any infrastructure. That's the key takeaway here. All right. All right. Should we, uh, should we kind of wrap up the technology portion? Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's, sum let's it up for me. How do you do Kubernetes, right? Yeah. <laughs> let's, yeah, let's, let's put it all together. Let's, uh, let's put it all together. Right. So this is, uh, this is the, um, this is a key takeaway here, right? Uh, committing to open source, we really, again, we harped on the open source aspect of, um, you know, the benefits of open source and why, you know, portability matters. Uh, we really want to get to a point where there is a standardization of operations, right? And you really want to start looking at clusters themselves as cattle, right? You know, the concept, the initial concept of like cloud native, uh, back in the day, people talked about, you know, cattle versus pets, right? And now it's gone to a point where you can significantly automate your operations, where you can start looking 
and your Kubernetes clusters themselves as cattle, right? So how do you do that is through the use of, you know, GitOps and declarative APIs, uh, just like you would, you know, deploy workloads on Kubernetes using deployments, uh, adopt a mindset that just allows you to declare the state of a Kubernetes cluster and get up and running, you know, really quick without any human intervention. You really don't want to be running scripts all over the place and, you know, uh, using something that's really custom and, um, you know, run into like operational challenges every time you decide to, um, you know, either stand up a new deployment or upgrade, you know, existing, you know, Kubernetes. So I can't uh, emphasize that enough. I, I, I was at, a, I know a company that was yeah. looking at opening a new region and mm -hmm. they were budgeting a quarter to open up their new region. Yeah. And, and the reason is that that bottom it's, it's all run by humans. Yes. Yes. There's scripted stuff. They've automated some things, but they are literally, yeah, it's going to take months to ensure everything is, is installed in that region. The clusters are created properly. They were running some Kubernetes and some VMs, but that's not the way you want to be when it's time to turn up another cluster somewhere. That should be as simple as a change in a config file and everything else happens. Everything, every bit in that stack from the deployment of Kubernetes, whether it's a managed Kubernetes or not, to every everything else that happens should be declarative and opening up that that new region or, you know, falling over to it. It might just be a new it might just be a new availability zone. Right. It doesn't have to be you're yeah. opening a new region should be uh, should be uh, done in that way. Yeah, exactly. And the power of and, and then. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And then I was saying, make sure that you're ready for your deployment patterns, right? You might have some things that need to run in a particular place. You might have some things that need to run on-prem. Understand those, those going in. So as you're choosing your solutions, they will work there. If you have a reason to run air-gapped clusters, whether on-prem or, or in the cloud or in a moving vehicle, for example, make sure that you're choosing a solution that's going to work in those, those different uh, deployment patterns. Yeah, exactly. Work your way backwards from you know what your business needs, right? You know that's that's uh, I <laughs> that's that's kind of like my line. You know, just working. Uh, don't do not make um, you know decisions that are really not going to serve your organization's you know purpose, right? So figure out like if it's an on-prem strategy that you need, or if there for specific reasons you need to have an air gap deployment, or uh, you're deploying a platform to the edge. You know, we've seen some pretty cool, you know, use cases where you want to move the compute, you know, towards the edge, you know, where the data is, right? And you can definitely uh, enable or you can use Kubernetes to build a platform that enables that deployment pattern, right? So I think we find that like pretty exciting. It definitely lends itself to uh, enabling really cool use cases, you know, going, going forward, right? Um, you know, I made this comment earlier, the world is, you know, increasingly, uh, app centric and getting digitized and, you know, people uh, want to build applications that, um, um, you know, unlock new streams of revenue or whether it's uh, just engaging uh, new customers or like, you know, figuring out um, ways to, you know, optimize on how experiences for your end users might look like, right? And all these lend themselves to like different deployment patterns. And we think, you know, a Kubernetes based platform uh, obviously done right <laughs> is, uh, you know, a, a way of definitely uh, tackling those, um, you know, business challenges, right? And then all the- Okay, be, yeah. be, hold on, be, being cognizant of time, I think we should say, yeah. okay, so, th so this is how you do it right from a technology perspective. Yeah. Uh, but I know that there's one last point you want to hit, and that is, uh, is, is it just technology? It's not just technology, right? So uh, this is, you know, for folks who, uh, who have uh, worked with me in the past, it's like they always say, uh, for me, a success is a function of, you know, people, process, and technology, right? So while we spent uh, the lion's share of this presentation, you know, just talking about, you know, the technology challenges or how we, we solve for some of these technical problems, um, you know, be cognizant of the fact that we really need to involve um, people and uh, build the appropriate processes in order to be successful as well. So, you know, this graphic again just talks about, you know, some of the common, you know, user challenges that, um, you know, organizations grapple with in order to like, you know, get this right. Um, so some of this includes, you know, just making some of these cultural changes, right, in order to have a DevOps mindset or start building a you know practice around you know GitOps, you need to have transparency and collaboration, right? So highly siloed organizations, you know, where uh, think of it as you know the development teams not talking to the operational teams or vice versa, um, you know, that really doesn't you know really lend itself or like put you in a position where 
uh, you're going to be successful with this initiative that you're taking on, right? So I, I think that that's the, the most interesting thing here is that yeah. when you ask users what their challenges is, number one is culture, yeah. right? Number one isn't, isn't a technology. And this is what you ask the people, the, the issues. And if we go look at the organizational challenges on the next slide, I think you see something else very interesting, which is when you ask organizations, what's the biggest problem for you adapting, adopting Kubernetes? Look over there, monitoring health and performance of Kubernetes clusters seems like that'd be important. It's relatively small. More important is the thing we all hear about is how do I refactor my monolith to, to actually run in Kubernetes? But even that, more important than that is the thing that Shafiq, we've talked a lot about today, which is how do you manage Kubernetes itself and that ecosystem, all the components? But the most important thing is the people, right? The number one challenge people are having. And what I find that's interesting in this, two thirds of people say their biggest problem with cloud native is finding, attracting and retaining qualified Kubernetes talent. My opinion, Shavik, is they're, they're looking at this the wrong way, that you can't look at how do we hire all new people who understand Kubernetes. I think that the lesson that I'm hoping that CIOs, CTOs, our CEOs are learning here is that we've got to bring our people along. We've got to give our people the practices, the tools, the training, what they need to adopt to this new world. Because if, if you're going to be trying to replace all of your developers, all of your operators, you're going to fall farther behind. Yeah, exactly. Uh, invest in your people. There's uh, great training available from an operator, you know, persona perspective. Um, there's great training that you know allows developers to you know adopt a cloud native mindset and leverage you know Kubernetes effectively, right? So that's definitely you know part of the solution, right? Which will segue you perfectly into. Hey, hey look at that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what it is. It's it's all about you know people, process, and technology, right? It's about organizing for success. You know, um, you know, the making the cultural changes are probably the hardest, right? But that's something that you definitely have to take a, a look at. You know, if you really want to become you know a DevOps or GitOps you know process uh, based organization, you know, uh, changing your organization to reflect that is something that needs to happen, right? Training and en enablement is key. Um, if you don't have, you know, the cycles or, you know, you are struggling to like, you know, really get your enablement programs or your cultural change programs off the ground, engage with an expert or, you know, just figure out if there's a vendor out there that can, you know, help you with your journey, right? And, you know, they can come to the table, give you the best practices, known practices, and, um, you know, that way accelerate your journey for, to cloud native maturity, right? Yep. All right. That's it. So this is going to be the real uh, final slide here, right? Which is um, just tying all of this together. Uh, so what do we mean by doing Kubernetes right? Um, you know, adopt a complete platform, right? So Kubernetes is just Kubernetes. If you're looking to build a feature complete platform, uh, there's a lot more that you need to think about. Uh, keep it open, you know, leverage uh, open source. It gives you the benefits of uh, all the innovation that's going on in the ecosystem gives you the portability uh, associated with like using open source technology, but there is a significant amount of um, you know, innovation in the automation space as well, which just allows you to like really treat uh, the platforms or your clusters as cattle, right? You know, declare everything, um, allow you know, the automation to do its work, right? And um, hybrid and multi-cloud is the destination. You know, a lot of um, you know common deployment patterns nowadays are hybrid and multi-cloud in nature. Um, again, it all comes down to what your business needs, and uh, it's just not about the technology. So think people, process, and technology, right? There are some questions uh, that we've got in Domenico Vigiani asks, uh, does GitOps add too much complexity, uh, which is which is his first impression. Um, having seen GitOps really done in practice, because uh, uh, I did spend seven years at Google, and, and again, a lot of these principles come from what was already working at Google. I will say, no, GitOps removes complexity. And I know that's counterintuitive because we're not working that way. But when you, when you get to the point that everything, the, the deployment of your application, the deployment of your infrastructure is declarative, it becomes much, much easier to, to operate things. And that's, you know, that, that's the, the real lesson to learn is that there is a learning curve with GitOps and that's why we ha you have to bring your people along and understand them. But when you have that declarative nature of your application, um, it, it makes running an application 
much easier, right? You tell the system, hey, this needs to run. It always needs six pods up, right? That's it. You no longer have to have someone who's operating, an operator who knows if something's going wrong in the middle of the night, they've got to figure out, okay, who pressed what button to do the wrong thing so that this isn't working anymore. The system has a checked in state that says, no, we need six pods running. The system will handle that. And, and the example I gave of turning up a new, uh, a new region uh, is, is very, um, is, is really, really, you, we know how to do it today. So we can enumerate and say, yeah, we know how to do that. It's going to, it's going to take us three months, but we can, we can get the clusters turned up, the right servers turned up, the right things installed, or you move to a complete GitOps way and, and, and the deployment is all automatic from the, the clusters themselves, every component on top of the clusters, including your application. So there's a learning curve, but it's when you, when we, you know, you, you learn this new way of doing things and you realize, no, it's not more complicated. It's just different. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Dan, go ahead. I was going to say, do you want to take the next one? Uh, this, this, this is not an advertisement. This is a real, real question. Uh, what other advantages are, and tool sets are available with the D2IQ Kubernetes platform, other than the ones that were shown on that slide? We had that that slide with all those bullets. What else? What else does D2IQ bring? Thank you for the question. Uh, what else does D2IQ bring? So D2IQ, uh, the D2IQ Kubernetes platform to be specific, um, again, under the covers, the technology that we use in order to like help out our customers with this declarative way of approaching both operations and application deployments is, uh, you know, through the use of, you know, cluster API and, you know, Flux CD, right? So uh, just getting into the uh, one level lower, uh, the way we orchestrate or obfuscate the underlying infrastructure uh, is through the use of, um, you know, cluster API, right? So if it's uh, EKS or it's um, another uh, managed, you know, Kubernetes service, uh, it works consistently and you have that similar experience, you know, either through the CLI or through the UI to be able to orchestrate any of the underlying, you know, cloud infrastructures, right? Uh, how we deploy what we call those, you know, applications or, you know, what we, the applications that you need in order to be platform ready is through, you know, the use of GitOps, right? Through the use of Flux CD, where, you know, we are able to, um, you know, give you an opinionated stack. And I think uh, this will answer the other question, um, you know, that just came in as well, right? Which is a list of technologies that work with DKP and, you know, and whatnot, right? So we have DKP has got an opinionated set of like applications that make you production ready. Uh, but then again, it goes back to the uh, value proposition that we just discussed with Kubernetes, which is the whole uh, pluggability aspect, right? You can choose to like, you know, turn off like, you know, one of those applications and, um, you know, just deploy your own, right? And we do have a list of, um, you know, uh, vendors that we have worked with to like, you know, um, get those applications supported and you know certified but we have a pretty rich you know partner ecosystem as well uh, that we work with you know to ensure that you know their solutions you know work on um, you know the kubernetes uh, platform that d2iq builds right and again at the end of the day it's open source kubernetes so if there are instructions perhaps on how do you deploy let's say illumio here for network segmentation on kubernetes you know there's a very high probability it's just going to work out of the box right so we can definitely discuss that a little bit more, yeah. So thank you very much for the questions. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, oh, oh, question, and... last one, one last one came in from Luis Felipe. Uh, what, what option is better, OpenStack on top of Kubernetes or Kubernetes on top of OpenStack? <laughs> uh that is that is interesting i don't know if i have an opinion on that right when i've worked with openstack in the past you know i've always looked at openstack as an infrastructure as a service solution right and the container orchestration piece that sits on top of the infrastructure as a service solution i know that there are there are a couple of solutions that look at it a little bit inversely as well uh, but I don't know if I have an opinion on that. That is something that we have to, you know, look into. Uh, my immediate reaction is um, uh, I'm just aware of OpenStack as just being an infrastructure as a service provider uh, that, you know, Kubernetes could potentially, you know, sit on top of and, you know, orchestrate, you know, containers for, right? But, um, um, you know, there needs to be some research that we need to do to figure out the pros and cons of uh, the other topology. Right. I'm certainly hearing customers again talking about Kubernetes running on top of OpenStack because they look for 
what goes between Kubernetes and the bare metal? Are you going to install something there or not? Um, and and if you in OpenStack certainly is a, a possibility. So thank you for the question. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. Shafiq, thank you very much for walking me through this and and help me out, help me learn a little bit. Um, with that, why don't we turn this back over to Candice at the Linux Foundation. Thank you so much, Shafiq and Dan, for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.